Okay, welcome to Psych 235, uh, Child Psychology. Today, we're starting our last chapter, chapter 16, uh, and it's Adolescent Psychosocial Development. There's a lot of interesting stuff. We're going to talk about all of this. First, we're gonna mention some theories of adolescence, and um, I'm gonna go through this those a bit quickly. I mean, I could spend a lot of time on those, but this is not Psych 101. You should have heard of most of these before, with the exception of a couple. And then we'll talk about identity, we'll talk about family and friends and some very important, interesting stuff there. Mental health issues and drugs, all that stuff we'll get to uh, uh, next time. So let's talk about theories of adolescence. Uh, one you probably haven't heard about uh, is the theory proposed by G. Stanley Hall. He said that adolescence is a period of uh, storm and stress is what he said. He believed that you know, teenagers, adolescents, they're very moody. So their moods shift, right? They can be very angry, very suspicious. They can be very happy, very sad and depressed. Uh, they're very moody. It's almost like they're bi bipolar, but they're not. They're just very moody. And they're not very trustworthy. Adolescents do a lot of bad things, according to uh, G. Stanley Hall. You can't trust them, okay? It's a period of rebellion, right? It's characterized by a lot of turmoil, right? A lot of problems maladjustment, okay, psychological problems, behavior problems, tension means a lot of stress, rebellion, you know, challenging the parent's authority, causing problems with the law and with teachers, right? Also dependency, they become dependent on others like their friends and relationships, and a lot of conflicts, a lot of problems, and exaggerated peer group conformity. In other words, <clears throat> teenagers, adolescents wanna be too much like their friends, like the people who they think are cool. They care too much about that very shallow stuff. <clears throat> so G. Stanley Hall had some very bad things to say about adolescence. He had a very negative view of it. Um, I can tell you that, um, well, it's a very early theory. And uh, yeah, back then, uh, you know, uh, it was, uh, things were uh, different than they were now, okay? Uh, people were expected to be a lot better behaved and, uh, it's different. Um, people were a lot more conservative back then compared to conservative people now are a lot less conservative, a lot more liberal uh, than conservative people back then. And G. Stanley Hill was one of these uh, conservative people. He was religious, as far as I can remember. And he had some very bad things to say about adolescents. He didn't even want adolescents to even masturbate or have sexual thoughts or anything like that. Okay. So he had a very negative view of adolescents, but not everybody did. <clears throat> Uh, Freud's theory, Freud in general doesn't view uh, uh, human beings in a very positive way, um, but he, what he said about adolescence, <clears throat> if you remember, his, well, actually his theory, uh, is that adolescence is a time when strong sexual urges reemerge and are directed toward others. Remember that during the phallic stage, when you were about uh, four to about five or six, right, uh, that's when the sexual urge first, re -emer first emerges, according to Freud, and you become sexually attracted to the opposite sex parent. That then gets suppressed, gets denied, so that you can carry on with the other stages. And then the last stage, right, um, <clears throat> is when the sexual urge reemerges and it's direct to other people. Now it's undeniable, right? And these sexual urges must be used to develop a mature adult relationship, right? That includes commitment, caring, compromise, not just sex. So Freud said that basically the sexual urge reemerges and must be directed at other people, right? You try to develop a relationship with somebody else. You take a strong interest in others, right? Um, and you have to learn about what a good relationship is like. A good relationship is not just about looks. It's not just about sex. It's not just about the physical, but it's about caring for one, for one another, committing to one another, compromising, right? It's about helping each other and being a team, okay? It's, uh, you know, helping each other out. <clears throat> Of course, adolescents at first get it wrong. They care too much about looks. They can't, it's, the, it's the urge that's basically very physical that's driving them. It's all very hormonal. They don't really know what they're doing. And um, you know, uh, they get into trouble if they don't have good parents to basically slow them down, so to speak, um, hold them back a little bit uh, because they wanna jump right in, right? To having these relationships when this urge you know, reemerges. And that can be as early as 12, okay? They're not ready for a relationship. They're not ready for sex or anything like that. So, you know, they need to first uh, sublimate the sexual urge, right? Use it for activities, for school, things like that. Uh, and then 
as they get older and they're a bit more ready, then they can start practicing these relationships. So of course, you know, with some uh, <clears throat> supervision from adults. And then eventually they get ready and they grow up and, and they know how to handle themselves in a relationship. But it takes some trial and error, it takes some time. Erickson's theory, uh, Eric Erickson theory. Uh, Erickson said that during adolescence, um, the main issue during adolescence is identity. So the stage of Erickson's theory that, um, that you know, relates to the period of adolescence is called identity versus role confusion. So identity is the, certain, uh, the, the main issue here, all right? That we become concerned about who we are and what we're gonna do with ourselves. So that's why we care about what we look like, who we hang out with, right? <clears throat> Fitting in, that kind of stuff. So adolescence is a time to resolve identity, according to Erickson, that's the main issue. We strive to achieve an identity and give up or repudiate all other identities and lifestyles, right? We try to uh, determine who we are and what we're gonna do with ourselves. And that means that other identities, we're gonna have to give those up because at first we may not know what we're doing. We may, we wanna fit in, we wanna be cool. We wanna be like our friends, right? Um, <clears throat> and we may find that um, we don't fit in that well because people will try, you know, different things. There's a bit of experimentation goes on. You know, some people try their uh, luck at being a jock, so to speak, an athlete or being one of the popular kids or maybe <clears throat> something else, being a cheerleader or, or something. You know, they experiment with different identities, but eventually we have to repudiate those other ones that don't really fit, don't really match, right? Um, and develop our own identity, okay? If we're unable to repudiate, if we're unable to give up those other identities that we've tried that didn't work, right? Then <clears throat> we won't know who we are. And that would mean that we, we can't keep a job. We won't be able to keep a job because we don't know who we are. So we don't know what to do with ourselves. We don't know what career we should take. So we won't be loyal to a job. We won't be loyal to friends or significant others because we don't know who we are. So we'll keep trying different things, trying to fit in in different places. And <clears throat> we wanna keep our options open if we haven't made up our mind about who we are. Just like when you go to college, right? You want your options open at first. You don't really know what you wanna do with yourself. So you take different classes. You wanna be held down to one major yet or one thing. And then as you try a few things, then you'll basically make up your mind, say, yeah, I wanna be this. I wanna major in this. I wanna major in psychology, right? But same thing goes for identity. If you um, can't uh, basically make up your mind, then you want your options open and you're not gonna be loyal to anything. You know, there are, <clears throat> those that even when they grow up still haven't made up their mind about who they are or don't care about who they are. Um, and those people usually are not loyal to anything or anyone. You know, they usually move from job to job, right? Uh, <clears throat> they move from place to place. Um, they have no loyalty to anything, according to Erickson. So adolescence is a time of indecision about identity. It's a time when we should be worried about who we are. And that's what happens during adolescence, right? All of a sudden we care about what we look like. Before that, our parents bought our clothes. Our parents told us how to wear our hair. They did our hair or whatever, things like that. Now you're an adolescent and now you wanna decide for yourself what you should look like, what clothes you should wear and how you should wear your hair and who to hang out with and all that stuff. All of a sudden you care about you know, how you are and how you look and where you fit in. So we're supposed to be a bit worried about it. That's healthy. <clears throat> if you can tolerate that indecision, that anxiety about identity, that leads to a positive identity. You're supposed to think about it and be concerned about it. Intolerance leads to pre premature foreclosure. If you can't tolerate the indecision, the anxiety that comes from not knowing who you are, from wanting to fit in all that stuff, if that bothers you, what usually happens um, is that, uh, what can happen, I should say, is that you might, um, uh, you might, um, make a decision right away without really thinking about it. And that's premature foreclosure. It's basically when other people tell you who you should be and you agree with them. And usually what that means is that you give in to your parents uh, basically demands about who you should be. So maybe uh, you grow up in a military family and you're, con and you're an adolescent, you're concerned about your identity, but it bothers you and you don't really uh, you know, like being uncertain about things. So you just go along with what your, you know, with your fam, you know, with what your family wants, and you decide that you're going to join the military and you're going to be, you know, part of the military just because you come from that military family. It's a very strong identity there. 
Or maybe you're going to be a pastor just like your dad or a farmer like your daddy, or you're just going to be a stay at home, uh, you know, wife and, you know, raise the kids just like mommy, right? That's what happens when you don't think about things very much. You let other people decide for you and you just go along with what people expect from you. And it may not be a healthy thing. It may not be something that really uh, <clears throat> defines who you are. Just because you grew up in a military family doesn't mean that you should go into the military, that that's the career you should take. That might not be right for you. Or just because your dad's a farmer doesn't mean you should be a farmer. Or that your mom's a homemaker means you should be a homemaker, right? Um, or that you should go into the, you know, and, and be a, a pastor or a priest or something like that because you come from a very religious family, right? You need to be concerned about your identity, you need to think about it, and you need to make your own decision. Premature foreclosure means that you just accept what other people want from you and you become what they want you to be, which may not be healthy. And you might find out later on that you chose the wrong path, okay? Um, there's other possibilities that we're gonna talk about because uh, James Marsha, this picture you see right there, James Marsha took this issue of identity that Erickson talked about it and developed it further, okay? James Marsha said that, you know, forming an identity involves questioning and commitment. So first you have to question your identity. You have to be concerned about it. You know, you have to have some anxiety over it. You want to figure out who you are. And then you also have to make a commitment. You have to decide on something. Those are two things you have to go through to resolve your identity. Now, it's possible that you don't question your identity or you do. It's possible that you commit or you don't commit. So there's two possibilities for questioning, two possibilities for commitment. Questioning, no questioning, right? Those are two possibilities. Commitment, no commitment, those are two other possibilities. Combine the two, the possibilities for questioning and commitment, and you get four possibilities. And these are the four possibilities that James Marshall came up with. Um, <clears throat> when you try to resolve your identity, right? Uh, you, might, um, you, might be, you might experience something called identity diffusion. And that's a situation where <clears throat> you didn't question who you were, you weren't concerned about it, you didn't care, right? No questioning, and you didn't commit to anything. So you are experiencing identity diffusion. Think of it like identity confusion. You don't know who you are. Few values and goals, few values. You don't know what you believe in. You don't care, right? Uh, you don't have any goals. You, you just don't care. Goals about school or work, what you're gonna do with yourself. You don't really care. These are the people basically who wanna hang out in their mother's basement and smoke weed all the time or just get drunk all the time or play video games or do whatever other thing they're doing and just waste their life away. They have no goals. They don't really care about who they are, right? That's what it is. They don't question their identity. Uh, they don't commit to anything. So they don't go anywhere and they don't care. That's a very bad situation. Identity foreclosure is uh, a little bit better, but not too good, okay, as well. I mentioned that one already. Identity foreclosure is when, um, <clears throat> when you don't really question your, um, your identity, okay? Uh, you know, you don't make your own, make up your own mind, okay? So what happens is, like I said before, is that uh, you don't really question your identity. You go along with what other people tell you about what you should be. You commit to an identity without really thinking about it that much. So, so there isn't really much question, much questioning. So what happens, you adopt your parents or society's roles without questioning. You decide to become, like I said, someone who, uh, a military person, a mil you know, someone in the military because that's the kind of family you come from. Or you be, decide to become a pastor because that's what your daddy is and that's what he wants from you. Or a farmer because you, you know, you grew up in a farm or something like that, right? Or a teacher because your mom's a teacher. You know, whatever it is. Um, the point is that other people decide for you and you go along with it. You don't really question it too much. That is not a very healthy thing as well. Not a very healthy thing but at least you, dis you make a commitment about an identity. <clears throat> it's not the worst situation, but it's also not the best. Identity moratorium is also not the ideal situation, but not as bad as identity diffusion. Identity diffusion is the worst one, right? Where you don't commit to anything, you don't care, right? That kind of situation. Identity moratorium is when you have questioned your identity, you are concerned about it, but you haven't committed to anything. You, <clears throat> you kind of need time to decide. That's what a moratorium is, right? And that might be, you might, for instance, decide that you're gonna to go to college because you don't know what you wanna be yet. So you're gonna to go to college, try a whole bunch of different classes and see what you like, and then maybe decide on a career, right? That's what you guys are doing in college for the most part. You go to college and you wanna figure out what you're gonna do with yourself. 
Some of you have some idea, a lot of you do not, especially when you're first starting off. And you take, you know, English classes and, you know, chemistry and physics and psychology and history and different things. And you're trying to figure out what you like. It, it's a good idea to find something you like and then to look in, into that a little bit more. That would be right for you. And that's what you do. And then as you go through college, then you're closer to resolving an identity. Maybe you, you, you go through, you pick a major and hopefully that becomes your career, right? So a moratorium is like a timeout, right? I need more time. I'm concerned about this, but I need more time to figure things out. That's not necessarily unhealthy. It's not necessarily bad, but it just means you need more time. Also, some people in the military, some people join the military, not because they want to be a military person their whole lives, but because they want more time to figure out who they are. Say, I don't know what I want to do with myself. Uh, let me go into the military and just do that for a while. And then, uh, you know, the military can then, you know, pay for my school because there are programs like that where they'll pay for your education. And I'll do that. And uh, in the meantime, you know, try to figure things out, right? Try to learn some things. That's identity moratorium as well. You haven't really made a decision. You're just taking a time out and you're going to join the military, right? Be there for a few years and see what happens, right? Um, there's another possibility. You know what the rich people do? The ones who uh, are concerned about identity but haven't made a decision, haven't decided, when they go through identity moratorium, you know what rich people do? They decide they're going to travel. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> they're ready. They're graduated from high school. They're ready for college, let's say. Uh, but they don't know what they want to do with themselves. They don't know if they want to go to college or join the, you know, the music industry or the movie industry. Remember, rich people have a lot of options. They know a lot of powerful people. A lot of people can get them into this business or that business, right? They're very privileged. Okay, and I'm talking about people who are very rich. I'm not just talking about people who are upper class, but the rich people. So what they often do is say, okay, you don't know what you want to do, but okay, let's just go travel the world. Let's see different places, different cultures, and try to find yourself, right? And, you know, learn about yourself. And then maybe then you'll have a better idea of what you want to do with yourself, right? That's what rich people do. It must be nice, right? You know, it takes years to go and travel the world and then come back as a more cultured, more learned person, so to speak. And then maybe have a better idea of what you want to do with yourself when you go and experience different cultures and different lives and just, you know, put yourself out there and see what happens. I know someone who uh, went to Japan because remember, I went to USC, right, for graduate school and there were undergrads there who were pretty wealthy. I know someone that after she finished college, she went to Japan. <laughs> she never came back. She went there um, and uh, while she was there, uh, she basically met some people um, and she liked music. She started making music and she basically, you know, she didn't come back. She stayed over there. She started making music, started her own band and uh, eventually got into the movies. And now she's on TV. She became, she became a, a musician slash actress uh, slash model. They really like people who look like her in Japan. She looks like one of those anime characters with a big head and the big eyes and kind of thin and, uh, you know, the blue eyes and of course white, you know, they like people who look like those characters over there. And that's exactly what she looks like. She went over there and found a lot of success. I'm not saying that she made it big, that she made it rich, but she's in the industry and she's been there. Well, ever since I was in graduate school, it's been like uh, 16 years or so. That's what happened to her <laughs> when she went and she traveled, uh, right? That happens to people sometimes. You go out there and you find something. Doesn't happen to everybody though. Uh, identity achievement is the best situation. That's when you do question who you are, you are concerned about it and you make a decision. You've thought about your identity. Maybe you try different things, right? And you figure out who you are and you decide an identity. You decide who you are, you decide what you wanna do with your life, what career you're gonna take. And that's a healthy thing. That's ultimately what you want. I went through the whole moratorium thing. You know, I went to college and I went to graduate school, right? Took me a long time to establish my career and establish my identity. And what am I now? Well, part of what I am is a professor, right? Uh, but I know I am other things as well, but I know who I am, right? That's what James Marsha said, really added to this um, concept of identity that um, Erickson talked about. All right, let's talk about other things. What about your religious identity, okay? It's another thing that uh, people often struggle with that they think about and they try, try to come to some conclusion about. Um, here's the thing about identity. Research shows that most adolescents accept broad outlines of parental and cultural religious identity. So what this really says is that most adolescents 
will develop the religious identity of their parents. You brought up in a Christian household, you're going to be a Christian. You brought up in a Muslim household, you're going to be a Muslim. And that's what the way it is for most people. Very few people actually decide that they're going to have a different religion other than the one they brought up with, that they were brought up with. Some of them question it and don't really believe in it. And then they end up coming right back to where they started, to what their parents uh, were trying to teach them. And they adopt the same religious faith. That's what happens to most people. Okay, there are some people who go against, you know, whatever they were taught and decide to be atheist or decide to be something else. There are, for instance, people who have been brought up Christian decide to be Jewish. Or people who are brought up Jewish decide to be Christian. Um, I haven't heard of too many Muslim people deciding not to be Muslim. Um, but usually people are very strongly committed to one or the other. And it's usually what they've been brought up with. Okay, so they don't really think about their own religious identity for themselves. Okay, they just kind of just go through this foreclosure. They just accept what people tell them. Um, specific religious beliefs may be questioned, however. Um, usually adolescents are a bit more... Uh, progressive, a bit more liberal than their parents when it comes to religion. For instance, your parents might be against gay marriage, whereas most adolescents are not opposed to it. They're okay with it. That's what happens, right? Uh, that adolescents are usually a bit more open-minded. Every generation is actually a little bit more open-minded than the last. I'll put it to you this way, and I said this already. Today's conservative people, or to, you know, whatever it is, um, are a lot less conservative. They're a lot more liberal than the conservative people 100 years ago. The liberal people 100 years ago are more conservative than the conservative people today. Today's religious people are a lot more progressive, a lot more liberal than the people were 100 years ago. That's just the way it is. As we evolve the society, we become more accepting, more tolerant, more open to new ideas. And that's what happens over time. There are plenty of people who fight this, of course, and want to go back to the old ways. But back in the old ways, there's a lot of Racism, there's a lot of prejudice, there's a lot of intolerance, and a lot of it had to do with religion, by the way. Wars fought over religion. Um, we're, as we become more accepting, more open, more liberal, more progressive, right? Um, we become more accepting of, uh, of people. And I like where things are going, right? We're learning to get along with each other. We used to kill each other, okay? The more back, the further back you go in history, the worse it used to be. People used to fight over, you know, over religious beliefs. Muslims and Christians used to kill each other. Jewish people and Palestinians, they still do, okay? But it's getting better. People are thinking more for themselves and becoming more accepting, more open to different kinds of people, different ideas, different religions. And that's the way it should be. And by the way, that's, the way, that's what this country was founded on, the U.S., religious liberty, religious freedom, and also the right not to have a religion, the right to be an atheist, to think what you want, right? Um, that's what it means. Religious freedom doesn't mean that you just have one religion and that you have to accept it. No, it means that you can choose whatever you want. And you have to, uh, you know, um, accept, so to speak, or not, or, or tolerate people who are different from you. If you're Christian, you should have nothing against Muslims, okay? If you live in this country, we have religious freedom. It means you can worship what you want, but so can Muslims, so can Jewish people, so can people who are not atheists. I mean, who are atheists, I should say. That's what it means to have religious freedom. It's not just about protecting the people who are religious. It's about protecting everybody, no matter what you believe. Okay, but you know, like I said, uh, the research shows that for the most part, we just go along with what we've been taught. We don't really think about it as much. We do a little bit, not as much as, as we probably should, but you know, um, we know what we know, so to speak. Let's keep going. What about your political identity? I, I have bad news about your political identity, okay, as well. Uh, research shows that most adolescents, again, just follow parental political traditions. Most of you, when it comes to your political identity, let's say just say whether you're going to be Democrat or Republican, those are the two dominant political groups here in the U.S., most of you are just going to go along with the group that your family supports, your mother, father. You come from a, you know, Republican household where they vote Republican, they believe they have Republican, they believe in Republican ideals, right? That's what you're going to be for the most part. If you've grown up in a democratic household, mostly going to be democratic, and that says uh, that doesn't that's not really good, by the way. All right, we should decide for ourselves. Okay, we have these two groups fighting each other, and people aren't really thinking about what side they're on. They're just accepting whatever they've been told by the group, so to speak. Okay, I will tell you though that adolescents, just like with religion, they do tend to be more liberal than their parents. Even if you should happen to be Republican, conservative, whatever you want to call it, right? Like I said, adolescents are more likely to support gay marriage, more likely to support 
for instance, uh, reform of, uh, you know, of the whole, you know, police thing, right? Where a lot of conservatives are opposed to that, but adolescents are a bit more open-minded. They do see the problems, right? And they are aware of them. They're more likely to believe that, yeah, we should do something about this, right? Fanatical political religious movement is rare. Um, there are some people who are very extreme, by the way, okay? Extremely Republican, extremely uh, Democrat, extremely liberal or conservative, whatever you, you wanna call it, right? And they're the ones who are always fighting and shouting and wanna kill the other side and you know get rid of the other side. Those people are rare. Most of us can get along with each other, okay? But what we hear about is our, we hear about on the news and what we hear about are the crazy people who are shouting and screaming and fighting each other. And by the way, our politicians are doing that right now, okay? And this is what we hear about. And it's like, we have to pick sides and you have to realize that we have a lot more in common than separates us, okay? And we shouldn't be fighting that much about it. Sure, we disagree about some things, but we mostly want the same thing, okay? Most adolescents identify with their ethnicity as well. I will tell you also that identity also, I mean, um, political identity also varies with ethnicity. And I, I can tell you more about this. Uh, most black people are gonna vote Democrat. About 90% of them or something like that voted for Obama. Um, the percentage of them who vote Democrat might be around 80%. Now Obama was very popular and stuff like that. So I think a higher percentage of black people voted for Obama, but, um, but I think for Trump, I think uh, Trump only got like 20% of black votes or something like that. But um, either what I'm telling you is that most black people are gonna vote Democrat. And for obvious reasons, okay? Because the Democrats are more likely to believe that in police reform, believe that we need to pass laws, right? To fight racism and discrimination and things like that, that we still have those problems. Republicans are less likely to believe that and say, no, we don't have as many problems, right? It's just overblown and it's really not that bad and that this is all just a bunch of baloney, right? Um, so most Democrats are gonna side with Democrats. I mean, most black people are gonna side with Democrats for that reason. Same thing with Latinos. Most of them are gonna side Democratic because that's the group that protects them the most, okay? They're, they're you know, the Republicans are more anti-immigrant, okay? Um, not all of them are, but what I'm saying is, I, 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 here's a, put it to you this way, not all Latinos actually vote Democrat. There's about a, a third of them who actually vote Republican. And those are the ones that are a bit more conservative, maybe the ones that have businesses and care about lower taxes and things like that. But most Latinos, uh, because of the issue of immigration, right? Uh, and because of the issue, again, of racism and prejudice and things like that, uh, and inequality are gonna side with the Democrats because Democrats wanna fight more inequality and, and that kind of stuff. And it is a problem, but one group says it's not as big of a problem and the other group says it is, and they fight for different things. Republicans call Democrats communists, right? They just wanna give everything away and help everybody and, and have everybody be the same. And that's not true. And basically, um, you know, and, and then Democrats say that the, uh, the Republicans are all intolerant and racist and sexist and all that stuff. And that's not true either, right? We have a lot more in common than we think we do. We disagree about how to achieve our goals, right? How do we have a more just society? Because we disagree on, on those things. Uh, white people, most of them are gonna be Republican. Not all of them, but about two thirds of them are gonna be Republican. White men, about close to three fourths of them or 70% or something like that are gonna be Republican, okay? Um, it, uh, it, that's the group that speaks more to their needs. And that's what you find. Jewish people, more Democrat, okay? Um, that's what it is, okay? And for the most part, our political identity, most of us are just gonna go along with whatever we've been brought up to believe. We don't question it that much. And I think we should think about it some more, okay? We really need to think about this and, uh, and not just believe what people tell us, right? We have Donald Trump questioning the election, saying there's fraud, there's all this nonsense, right? And it's not true. If you listen to the experts, you listen to even the people on his own side that are running the elections, right? But he says it, therefore the other people believe it, therefore all, a lot of the other Republican leaders believe it, and it's a bunch of nonsense. And that's what happens when we don't think for ourselves. We start fighting over stupid things. The election is over, okay? Donald Trump didn't win, but he's doing whatever he can to stay in power because the man is a narcissist, okay? And I've covered this in my Psych 101 class. We talked about psychological disorders. He suffers from narcissistic personality disorder. Let's tell you a little bit more, okay? And, and that's what's happening, okay? When you don't think for yourself, if we thought for ourselves, maybe we'd get along better instead of just listening to the extremists out there or the people who have a lot to gain, okay? 
Keep in mind that a lot of people don't want to oppose Donald Trump or go against what he says because he's very popular. Okay, a lot of people voted for him. And if, if, if you say something he doesn't like, even if you're on his side, he's gonna tell the people not to vote for you and then you're gonna be out of office. So they're all going along with his opinion, even though his opinion right now doesn't hold any water, all right? It, that's what it is, right? And we need to think for ourselves, okay? Both Democrat, Republicans, where you're Democrat, progressive, right? We need to stop listening to these extremists, okay? And think more for ourselves. I think we should all get closer to basically, uh, move a little bit more toward the middle, okay? And be a little bit more open-minded and be a bit more moderate or whatever it is. Uh, we have a lot of things we can compromise, a lot of things we can we can do if we just listen and learn to talk with each other. Uh, all right, let's keep going. I've said too much about that because politics gets me upset because of the nonsense I see out there and all the divisions and stuff like that. Uh, people fighting over, you know, over all kinds of things that they really have no control over, right? We don't control everything. We don't control anything, okay? They do, the leaders. And they're getting us to fight with each other uh, and they basically have everything and they, you know, it's just not right. Okay, I can go on and on about that. Vocational identity, that's something else that uh, becomes very important during adolescence. When you start thinking about who you are, you also start thinking about uh, what you're gonna do with yourself, your career, right? Your vocation, your job, right? Vocation, vocational identity takes years to establish. Uh, you probably won't, didn't know right out of high school what you wanted to do. It takes years to establish. Maybe you go on to college or you, maybe you go on to the military because you want to take some time or whatever to figure it out. Whatever it is, it takes years to figure that out. It took me years. When I first you know, went to college, I, you know, I was thinking about being an engineer. That's where I was leading to because I was good at math and the council told me, yeah, you should be an engineer. I went to a school that's very good for engineers. That's not who I am. And I found out that out the, the hard way, right? And then eventually through some trial and error here and there, right? I tried philosophy, tried different things. I wound up in psychology, all right? And that's what I think fits me best. But it takes years to figure out who you are and what you're gonna do with yourself, all right? Early vocational identity is no longer relevant. It used to be that in the past, you graduated from high school and you got a job right away and that's what you were gonna do. Nowadays, most people go to college. When you do have a job early on, it's not your, it doesn't really speak to your identity, right? You work at Subway, okay? Or you work at McDonald's or UPS, whatever it is. That's not who you are. That's just a job that you have temporarily to help you pay for school or to help you make a living while you try to find another job, a better job after you get some education or some training. It used to be in the past for that, that your early vocation day, whatever you decided early on, that was gonna be what you're gonna be, but not anymore. Part-time work during high school is often related to negative outcomes. Um, yeah, working during high school um, usually doesn't help you resolve your identity. Um, you know, I think I mentioned this before or it's coming up. The money that's used for school, uh, I mean, the money that people, that students earn, you know, while, while going to high school is usually used for drugs and clothes and, you know, and partying and things like that. It's not usually used for anything good. It doesn't really help that much to have a job during high school. Okay, as far as resolving your identity. Gender identity, what about gender identity? Something that a lot of people have been fighting about as well recently. I don't think it should be a big deal, okay? We shouldn't be fighting about it. But gender identity begins with the person's biological sex and leads to a gender role. So first it starts with your biological sex, right? Some people are born male, some people are born female. And there's plenty of people, by the way, that are somewhere in between, a little bit male, some female, right? Or mostly male, uh, whatever it is, and a little female. There, there's, there are variations, okay? Research is telling us that, that uh, it's not exclusively male or female like we, like we thought. It's, it's, there's some people who are somewhere in the middle. The percentage of those, I don't really know. But gender identity may be questioned, right? What does it mean to be a man, a woman, whatever it is? We're questioning that. Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can't be assertive, you can't be aggressive, you can't be a leader. Just because you're a man doesn't mean you can't be kind and nurturing and that you can't cry, right? We're questioning those things now. Instead of following those traditional macho uh, role or something out or traditional feminine role, um, gender roles are changing everywhere, not just in the US, but all over the world where people are questioning the traditions, right? Do we really have to be this way just because uh, you, know, you happen to be a man or a woman? They're questioning things everywhere. I'll put it to you guys this way. In, uh, I think in South Korea, if I'm remembering correctly, um, more makeup there is sold there to men than to women. And that's the younger generation, by the way. 
that is okay with using makeup. Now I know here in the US, makeup mostly for females, but in South Korea, you know, they're changing a bit and the young people are a bit different there. The older people still believe like in the old ways where the makeup is for women, that kind of stuff. But um, most makeup now is being sold to men in South Korea. They're, they're, there's different things going on over there, but gender roles are changing everywhere. Now there is a problem. The DSM-5 uh, points out something called gender dysphoria. That's when you're distressed about your biological sex. So maybe you're born a man, but you feel more like a woman and it really bothers you. It causes you problems, right? Where, um, you know, yeah, you don't know uh, how to fit in, what to do with yourself, whatever. It can cause all sorts of problems. I'll put it to you this way. There are people who have taken their own lives because they felt that they were wrong. They were born with the wrong body. Their mind doesn't match their body. It can be that distressing. For most people, it is not that distressing, but it still bothers a lot of people. Um, and now, um, you know, what those people are finding out and what we should know is that it's okay to be different. It's okay if your biological sex is that, that of a male, but you feel more like a woman and you wanna act like a woman, that's okay. Or if you were born more, if, or if you were born a woman, but you feel a bit more masculine, that's okay too. We should be accepting and tolerant of, of these things. People are who they are. They didn't choose this, by the way. It has to do with their biology and the way their mind developed. I can tell you a lot about this, okay? If you take a more advanced class, okay? We shouldn't be intolerant, okay? We used to be intolerant about race and culture, about religion. We used to kill each other over things. Now people are fighting over this thing and bathrooms and all, and all kinds of stuff like that. It's nonsense, okay? Can we just agree to just accept one another, okay? And treat each other kindly, you know? Can we agree on those things? Doesn't matter who you are. Here, put it to you this way. You shouldn't make fun of anybody, right? Whether they're old or young or this culture or that religion or gay or lesbian, or if they have, you know, belief, if they're, you know, male biologically, but they want to dress like females, we shouldn't make fun of anybody. And that's, and that point of view, by the way, is the progressive point of view. Yes, I understand that, right? That we should be accepting and tolerant of, of everybody. A lot of people don't agree with that, okay? But what's the alternative? That we're gonna hate each other and fight each other and deny each other's rights? That's not right, okay? And yes, I'm having a lot to say about this because a lot of this stuff is important and I'm passionate about a lot of these things. All right, but then again, I am an educated man who knows a lot of things, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about other serious things that are not so controversial, okay? <laughs> to put it that way. Let's talk about family and friends. So adolescence, um, you know, is a time where there could be some trouble, okay? But here's the thing, um, self-destructive self behaviors, a lot of self-destructive behaviors that can happen during adolescence with, um, can actually be avoided with the support of family and friends. If you have a good family, you have a good, you know, social network, a good, you know, you know friends that support you, um, then uh, research shows for the most part, you'll be okay because adolescence is actually, uh, the teenage years in general, are actually a very dangerous time, okay? It, it, because teenagers get into a lot of trouble. They can get depressed and suicide and all kinds of things. But if you have a good family, you have a good you know, friendship network, uh, they support you, they make you feel better, they make you stronger. And for the most part, you turn out okay. And another thing is that adolescents often seek out the companionship they, they need. Adolescents will seek out friends. They'll seek out loved ones. And here's the thing though, you have to realize that um, you know, they, uh, their friendships mean a lot to them. I know as a, their family also means a lot to them, but they also want to know from others, other than their family, uh, that they're okay, that they are loved. So they, you know, they, they really care about their friends, okay? And what their peers think. Adolescents become increasingly detached from parents and older adults. They start caring less and less about what mommy and daddy think, right? And they care more and more about what their friends think, what their peers think, because they're a bit, they're a better comparison for them, right? They're people their age. Mommy and daddy, if they're good parents, are always going to say that they're wonderful and smart and all those things. That's what good parents do. But they want to know realistically from other people where they really stand and, you know, that they have support and that they're okay. Um, there is a generation gap. There is a distance between the values, behaviors of the older and younger generation. Like I said, usually the younger generation tends to be a little bit more progressive, a little more liberal, a little bit more open-minded than the older generation. 
Okay, and it doesn't matter, you know, which generation we're talking about. If we talk about a hundred years ago, the younger people were still more progressive, right, than the uh, older people. Now, when people are a lot more open-minded and more progressive, the younger people are even more progressive. Okay, and that's what's happening. And in the future, even if you consider yourself progressive now or liberal, in the future, your kids will be more progressive than you probably. Okay, when you have your own kids, and that's just the way it is. Every generation becomes a little bit more open-minded right? A little bit more accepting. And you know what that is? That's freedom. That a little bit more freedom. Okay. Rather than just being stuck in a certain way of doing things and believing whatever you're taught to believe, you know, it's good to believe what you want to believe. Okay. And think what you want to think. And that means questioning things. And that, ma that means making up your own mind about things. But there is a generation gap, but there's more research about the generation gap. Uh, research shows the generation gap is actually not very large. There's not a big difference between, um, what older people believe and younger people believe if you compare young people to their own parents. When you compare the young people uh, to their own parents, uh, sure, the young people are still a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more progressive, more liberal, whatever you want to call it, than their parents, but they're not that different. When you compare adolescents, younger people with older people overall in general, there seems to be a big difference, okay? But if you compare people to their own families, the difference doesn't seem to be as large. Because remember, you've been raised in that family, they taught you some things, so you have a lot of things in common, okay? So the, the generation gap looks large if you compare just young and old, but if you compare young people with old people, with older people from their own families, it doesn't seem to be that different. Adolescents and parents actually view uh, family interaction differently. It's not just about politics and that stuff, but about all sorts of things, family interactions. Like for instance, a curfew, uh, is seen as an attempt to protect by parents. You know, they want to have a give a curfew to have a curfew for their kids. Say, I want you to be home at a certain time and go to bed at a certain time because I'm trying to protect you. There's a lot of bad things that can happen. I want to protect you, right? I want you to stay safe and I want you to be ready for school the more the next day and get a good night's sleep. But adolescents are more likely to see a curfew as just an attempt to control, uh, attempt that control, right? You're just trying to control me. They see it differently. That's an example of the generation gap where they see things differently. They see the same thing differently. Most parents believe their children are good and loyal despite the fact that they can be rebellious and maybe driven by hormones. And most adolescents believe their parents mean well, but maybe a bit old fashioned and out of touch. They don't, they're not um, you know, current, so to speak, with style, with the times or whatever it is, that they're a bit old fashioned and a bit uh, uh, outdated and they haven't gotten with the program, so to speak. They're not woke or whatever you wanna call it, right? Um, that kind of stuff. So there are some differences, but they're not as bad as, uh, as people think. Now, there is going to be some parent-adolescent conflict. During the teenage years, it's a time when, um, you know, there's a, there can be quite a bit of conflict. It's a, it's very, it's a very difficult time um, to deal with. As a parent, it is very hard to deal with very young children, and it's also very hard to deal with adolescents, right? This, it, some people say that this is the hardest time to be a parent, is when you're a parent of an adolescent or several adolescents. There's gonna be conflict, there's gonna be disagreements, there's gonna be trouble. It emerges in early adolescence, you know, in the early teens, 13, 14, and it happens more with early maturing daughters and, uh, and, their, mo and their mothers than fathers. So it, you're gonna have more trouble, according to research, when you have a daughter, right, in their early teens, might be 13, 14, 15, something like that, and she's developing very quickly and looking more and more like a woman, and she wants to date, and she wants to go out, and mommy is saying, no, you won't, right? No, uh -uh, no, you're not ready for that. I don't want you happy. I don't want you to do any of that stuff. I know what you want to do and I'm not letting you, right? There's going to be more problems of that kind, okay? You have a daughter developing very quickly, looks a lot more grown up than she is, okay? And, and there's going to be problems with the more problems with between daughter and mother during this time. It usually involves bickering. Bickering is when they basically fight over trivial things, over things that are not that important, you know, about like, keeping your room clean, about your haircut, like, why did you cut your hair like that? I don't like that, you know, or about you're really going to wear that? Like, no, that's not right, right? Arguing about these trivial things that don't really, are not really that important, but that's called bickering. People do that a lot, okay? Parents see, you know, uh, you know, this uh, bickering or them, them, you know, mentioning these things or questioning what their hair and their clothes and all that stuff as an expression of concern. I just want what's best for you. I don't want people to think the wrong things of you. I don't want people to judge you and all these things, right? 
My adolescents see it as unfair judgment. You're just judging me. You just don't want me to be who I am, that kind of stuff. So again, disagreement there about what's going on, right? Bickering peaks in early to mid adolescence. So it's worst around maybe 13, 14, 15, maybe 16 around there, and then decreases. And then it gets better as parents grant more autonomy. The problems subside or they get a lot better um, when the teenager gets closer to being an adult. 16, 17, and parents start to realize, okay, you're gonna be an adult soon. So maybe I need to give you a little bit more freedom. Maybe I need to maybe let you date and have a boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever it is. And um, you know, you're gonna be an adult soon anyway, so I'm not gonna be able to stop you. And that's what happens is parents eventually kind of start giving up. Not giving up is not a good word, but they start giving them more freedom, realize that they're gonna be an adult soon. So you might as well let them be ready, let them make some of their own decisions, let them make some of their own mistakes, but you're still there to protect them. Okay, um, there's adjustment on both sides. Parents will grant more autonomy and uh, adolescents will learn to appreciate their parents more and respect them a bit more, okay? But it's a very troubling time and I'm not there yet, but uh, I'm sure it's gonna be tough. My daughter's 10, she's gonna be an adolescent soon and she has a very strong will and she's developing very quickly. She's, on, she's already like five feet tall. She's only 10 years old and um, I, I foresee some trouble, but it's, the trouble is mostly going to be for my wife, <laughs> according to the research, not so much for me. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, me too, of course. Um, there's parent adolescent conflict, um, you know, from other points of view, like uh, it, it does happen um, with uh, other cultures as well. Um, but it's a little bit different because of greater emphasis on closeness and dependency, because other cultures are a bit more collectivist, like Latinos are a bit more family oriented, a bit, you know, their parents have a bit more control, so to speak, or, you know, Korean families, uh, Chinese families, they're a bit more collectivist, okay? A bit more family oriented. Uh, because of that, uh, of that greater closeness and dependency, um, Chinese, Korean, and, and Hispanic Americans or Latino Americans uh, do not develop big problems until a little bit later. Early on when you're 13, 14, whatever it is, 15, it's like, you don't have much authority as a Latino, as a or Chinese or Korean, whatever it's like, it's like your parents like say like, what, you question my authority, you know, and like, it's just not gonna happen. But when you get older, when you get to about 16, 17, and all of a sudden you're bigger and stronger and you're getting closer to being a man or a woman, that's when it starts. Because now you can challenge them. When you were little, they'll beat your ass, a lot of them, right? Not all of them, but a lot of Latinos do beat them. You know, it's kind of a, uh, they're more likely to use that authoritarian parenting style, by the way, Latinos, uh, Asian people, stuff like that, but it's not always about physical punishment. But what I'm saying is there are problems, but to develop a little bit later. I didn't question my mom or, you know, I actually, my dad was not, but uh, when I was, you know, 14, 15 or anything like that, it's like, no way. I was afraid of my mom. Okay. But when I got a little bit older and I got a little bit stronger, I realized that I could exert my authority a little bit more. And that's when the problem started. Okay. Former teen mothers tend to be too harsh or too permissive. Remember we talked, I think, if we, I remember if we talked about, because I have two classes that are very similar, this one in developmental psychology, but um, those that were uh, teenage mothers, um, you know, um, it's hard to raise a kid when you're a teenage mother. And what research shows about teenage mothers, they tend to be too harsh or too permissive with their kids. They're either too harsh because they don't want them to become teen mothers, want them to ruin their lives, so to speak. So they tend to be too mean, too harsh, too controlling or they tend to be too permissive and they let them do what they want. And that's a bad thing too. You need to learn to compromise and be somewhere in the middle. In general, I think with everything, we just need to be, we need to compromise, okay? We need to be somewhere in the middle. We need to be accepting and compromising, right? We need to talk things out. If conflict gets really bad and it leads to the point of having a runaway or a throwaway where your kid runs away and basically says, screw this, I'm out of here. I'm done, I'm, I'm out of here, right? Or a throwaway is basically when the parent challenges you, I mean, when the, the, the adolescent challenges you and they give you a lot of trouble and you basically kick them out of the house. You say, get the hell out of my house. You're not my son anymore. Get the hell out of here, right? If that happens, if they run away or if you kick them out, some very bad things are likely to happen. You don't want it to get to that point, right? It's more likely to lead to indiscriminate sex, unprotected sex, right? Drug use, violence, suicide, prostitution, all kinds of things like that. You don't want that to happen. These adolescents are not ready to take care of themselves. They don't have a reliable source of income, okay? They can't take care of themselves. They're not ready for the world yet. They need you. Don't let it get to that point where you kick them out or we basically 
uh, are so mean, so harsh that they basically leave. And that has happened, okay? And it does happen to people. And it usually doesn't wind up in a very good situation, okay? For a lot of Latinos, it ends up in delinquency. And I can tell you from my own point of view, not from, I haven't done it, but I mean, from people I know from Latinos, it ends up with a lot of delinquency, right? And, and gangs and things like that. Not a very good thing, okay? When the family doesn't work. Um, but uh, it's a bad thing either way, okay? Um, conflict is a part of growing up. There's gonna be problems, right? It's a part of growing up and becoming independent. Rules must be adjusting accordingly. Accordingly, If you're gonna be a good parent, you have to hold on to your kids very tightly, very closely when they're little. And as they grow bigger and more capable, you have to let them go. Little by little, you let them go. And they're ready for the world eventually. You can't keep them you know, on a tight leash uh, their whole lives. That's not gonna work. They're growing, getting bigger, stronger, smarter, and they want more and more independence as they get older. And, and there's, there, that's what's supposed to happen. But you need to, they wanna grow up all, really fast all at once. You have to slow them down, but you still have to slowly let them go. Let's talk about parental monitoring. I feel like I'm going too slow. I need to speed things up a little bit. I will be okay. Parental monitor, all this stuff is very interesting. Parental monitoring, what is parental monitoring? Parental monitoring is when parents check up on their kids, basically, on their teenagers, especially. That's the period of time we're talking about. So it's parental awareness of what the child is doing, right? Where they are and who are they doing this with, okay? Parental monitoring, parental awareness, right? Helps limit alcohol, drugs, and promote safety, right? It helps, you know, keep your kids in check, so to speak. It's a good thing um, in that sense, right? But too much is actually bad. Too much predicts adolescent depression. If you... Uh, if you are basically too controlling and you're always checking up on your kids and you, you always want to know who they are and you check on them constantly, right? Then your teenagers might feel like, you know, like they're basically imprisoned, you know, that they're, they don't have any freedom. And a lot of them will get depressed, especially teenage girls, by the way. Um, adolescents, they need some freedom to feel competent, trusted and loved, right? It's good to check up on them, know where they are and stuff like that. Um, but you also need to trust them, you know? and give them some trust, see if they can handle it, right? If they let you down, then you can tighten the reins a little bit, but you have to give them the benefit of the doubt and see how they do with it. Give them some trust, right? Give them some freedom and see what happens. But you should still know who, where they are in case something goes wrong. But you shouldn't be calling them all the time. Who are you with? Who are you talking to? Let me see them, put them on FaceTime, right? That kind of stuff all the time. And by the way, if teenagers wanna deceive you about that stuff, they can very easily, okay? I know I was an adolescent, I was a teenager. And I had a girlfriend and her mom was always checking up on her and she was with me and her, and she lied to her mom. Oh, I'm with my friend over here, blah, blah, blah. And she was really with me. So her mom didn't trust her, but she still find ways around, you know, around that stuff. If teenagers want to screw you over, they will. Okay. They're a lot smarter than you think. Okay. A lot more uh, sly, so to speak. It's hard for parents to show involvement, right. To monitor their kids, what they're doing and all that stuff without interference. Right. It's hard to show concern without suspicion. It, when you do this stuff, it looks bad from the kid's point of view, that you're suspicious, but you're interfering too much, you're controlling too much, right? It's hard for parents to kind of uh, do that uh, without seeming like they're too controlling. You have to kind of compromise a bit. Communication is important, right? You need to talk to your adolescents. It's important, but you should not make them feel guilty, anxious, right? Uh, and it can lead to distress and rebellion. If you're too controlling, too much parental monitoring, too controlling, right? Checking up on them all the time, being too mean, too harsh, too strict. It can lead to distress, right? They feel anxious, they get depressed or rebellion. Some of them will say basically, screw you. I'm gonna do whatever the hell I want. That's rebellion. And some of them will say, screw you, I'm out of here. That's the worst situation authoritative parenting is best, right? There has to be some compromise, communication, a little give and take, right? You have to adjust the rules as they get older. If you're the authoritarian type, really mean, very strict, don't show much love, right? Controlling and everything, um, then the, you're more likely to make your teenager depressed or rebellious, or maybe they're just gonna leave. That's the worst situation. Keys to family closeness, okay? Family closeness is more important than family conflict or individual autonomy. It's, here's the thing, being close, to your mother, your father, being close to your kid, all that stuff, that's actually more important than trouble you're gonna have, right? Uh, and then, then granting them freedom. If you're close 
things are going to be easier, okay? If they care about you, you care about them, and you talk to each other, you trust each other, then things are going to be a lot better. And family closeness, um, you know, relates to all these different things. Communication, right? Do family members talk to each other? Do they talk openly to one another, right? Is your adolescent going to tell you, right, when they develop a relationship with someone, when they get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? If they start having sex, are they going to tell you? Right? Do they trust you with that kind of stuff? Are you that close or are they going to hide it from you? Okay. Uh, families that are very close, mommy and daddy, or usually mommy, they'll know everything that's happening with a teenage daughter. A teenage daughter will tell them, right? Their first time and sex, they'll, they'll tell them, right? Uh, they communicate. They're very open. Okay. Uh, is there support? Do they rely on one another? Okay. Are they connected? How emotionally close are they? Okay. You know, how, how close are they? Or are they, you know, not so close, not, you know, disconnected? Um, what about control? Do parents restrict autonomy? How much, right? All that matters. Parental monitoring. Mutual close parent-child interaction is the most effective monitoring. Um, when you are close as a family, parental monitoring isn't a big deal. If you have a good relationship with your teenager, here's what's going to happen when they go somewhere. You don't have to check up on them. Okay, they will call you and they'll say, hi, mom, I'm with so and so, right? I'm over here and we'll be back around this time. You know, just wanted to let you know, right? I love you, bye bye, or something like that, right? It won't be a big deal. It will be mutual, it'll be, it'll be back and forth, there'll be communication. You won't have to be controlling, they won't have to hide from you if you have that kind of relationship. But not everybody does. Let's talk about peers, because adolescents care a lot about their peers, right? And their friends. Um, peers, remember, we've been talking about those for a, peers for a long time. Peers are those that are of a similar age, those that are similar to you in age, right? Usually similar in status because they usually live in the same neighborhood, right? Uh, usually similar economic status because if you're in a middle class neighborhood, most people there are middle class, et cetera, right? Um, peers are important, okay? Friendships are even more important. Friendships are crucial during adolescence. It's important that these adolescents have friends. Okay, they feel accepted and loved, not just from their parents, but from other people who are like them. Friendships become more pe personable, personal and more durable. They become more about what, you know, things they have in common, what they believe, and more durable, right? It, it's, you know, when your young friends kind of come and go, they change very quickly. When you're adolescent, you want to hold on to your friends. Uh, peer pressure is social pressure to adopt identities out of attitude, style, and behavior from peers. So peer pressure is when basically because other people your age are acting a certain way, doing certain things, um, or they look a certain way, you feel like you should be the same. That's peer pressure, right? Peer pressure rises in early adolescence until about 14. It's, it's actually, um, it's a bit uh, more problematic early on because peers feel like they, you know, they want to fit in. They want to be just like everyone else, right? I mean, peers, uh, adolescents, right? And then it declines as they get a little bit older, a little bit wiser, they realize that they don't have to be like everybody else. They still wanna be cool and fit in, but they're less susceptible to peer pressure as they get a little bit older. But peers are important because they help transition adolescents from childish behavior to adulthood, right? Uh, without your peers, um, you won't really know, um, you know, what's, you know, you know, sort of what to wear, so to speak, you know? Uh, and I remember going through this, right? I remember going through like, uh, you know, this period of time and my peers looking at me like, what are you wearing? What the hell is that? And like, it's like, and I said like, what? I don't buy my own clothes. Like, I don't have any money. It's like, dude, you know, well, you know, you should at least tell your mom what you want. Like, you know, she shouldn't be picking out your clothes for you. And peers will tell you things like, they'll help you with things like that. And they'll help you transition from being a child in which you're told what to do to being a teenager right? And beginning that compromise or being, having some more say into, you know, what you're going to wear and what you're going to do, right? Peer, peer, your peers are going to know what's in, what's cool, what's not cool. Mom is not, dad is not going to know that. They're out of touch. They're out of fashion. They've had their time, okay? Um, friends usually encourage desirable behavior. That's the good news about friends. If they do have friends, right, um, that they're going to encourage good behavior for the most part, not bad behavior, right? We worry a lot about friends and peers that they're going to make our kids start doing drugs and having sex before they're ready and all that stuff. But for the most part, what happens is that 
adolescents find other people like themselves. So if your kid's a good kid, they're going to find other good kids to hang out with. If your kid is a badass, by the way, they're going to find other badasses, right? You got to know what you have. But for the most part, they find people like themselves and they encourage decent behavior. Now, we do have delinquents and people like that who will encourage each other to do bad things, but that's a minority of people. That's not everyone. Peers can, peers can engage in behavior neither one would do alone. That can lead to trouble, okay? Yeah, peers can encourage each other to you know, drive too fast or take risks or things like that, uh, or maybe drink alcohol or too much alcohol or things like that, and that, that can be bad, okay? Maybe even to shoplift, things like that. It can lead to some bad behavior like that that they wouldn't do on their own. But, but this peer pressure, right, to do these bad things uh, is more likely to happen under negative uncertainty. It's when the, the adolescent is kind of uh, new to a certain school and they don't have any friends. They don't know how to, they don't know where to fit in, right? When they're just starting puberty, uh, when they're a bit more uncertain, that's when peer pressure can be, you know, kind of a more, uh, can have more of an, it can be more of an issue, okay? Because they might, they're more likely to admire the people who are considered cool. And those people might be aggressive. Those people might be drug users. Those people may not be the people who are smart, by the way. But most, the good news is that most peers will associate with those that are similar to themselves. And like I said, good kids usually hang out with other good kids. It's not the case that your good kid is gonna go and hang out with the gangsters, okay? Or hang out with the drug users if, if that's not who they are. I know I was a good kid. I didn't hang out with those people. <laughs> they didn't wanna hang out with me either, okay? More about peer pressure, more, most peer inspired misbehavior is short lived. If there is some bad behavior, it's usually short lived. It's not long term delinquency, right? Your peer might do some bad things here and there, like maybe uh, drink alcohol when they're not legally able to, or, or maybe even shoplift something or do something like that, right? That doesn't mean they're going to become criminals. Most of that is short lived. Even I did that, and I was a very good kid, okay? Peers allow adolescents to experiment with possible selves and and help with identity formation. Peers help you figure out who you are and try different things, right? You know, you meet people, you hang out with people, you try to fit in different places. Um, the ones that accept you are usually gonna be people who are like you and you'll find them one way or another. They, they you know, you end up finding your own kind, okay? Peers will deflect and defense against adult criticism. Your peers, especially your friends will make you feel better when, the, your, when your parents are kind of mean or unfair and things like that they'll, um, you know, they'll make you feel better. They say, yeah, I know what it's like. Yeah, my mom's, uh, you know, really controlling too. Yeah, my dad's a big ass and things like that. You know, they say things, they, have, they make you feel better. They make you feel like you're not the only one and we got your back, that kind of stuff. It's a very good thing, okay? Let's talk a little bit about love, okay? Because I'm not quite yet halfway, but a little bit about, about love so we can get to about halfway, okay? Uh, what about romance? First love, what does research says about, about your first love? Uh, first romances typically appear in high school and rarely last more than a year. Most of these first romances, right, don't last very long. They might last a few months or whatever it is. I had some that lasted two weeks, okay? When I was in high school, uh, I didn't even have a relationship that lasted more than two years. And that's pretty typical, okay? Girls are more likely to claim a steady partner, right, to say that this is my boyfriend or whatever it is uh, than boys. Boys are more likely to say, yeah, hey, man, I don't, even, I don't like her. It's like, oh, we're just friends. You know, they're kind of a little embarrassed about it, right? Uh, not all romances include intercourse. Yeah, that's what you have to understand about these teenage relationships is most of them are not having sex. And that's the way they are. Some of them might, but, um, you know, they're not always sexual. Okay, you need to calm down, right? Doesn't mean they're having sex. And especially if you're keeping tabs on your kids and make sure you're a responsible parent and you're close. And hopefully they'll tell you if something like that does happen. But most of them do not involve any sex. I you know, the people I was with in high school, I even, seen, I even had some girls in junior high. We weren't having sex. Like, neither of us knew what the hell we were doing. We didn't get that far. They didn't last that long, these relationships. Yes, I was a very good kid, okay? It didn't happen until later. All right, breakups and unrep unrepresented, unrep unreciprocated crushes are common. Uh, there's going to be a lot of breakups, okay? And there's going to be a lot of like, uh, that they like somebody, but that person doesn't like them or doesn't even notice them. That's going to be very common during adolescence. Adolescents are crushed by rejection and sometimes contemplate revenge or suicide. When they do break up or they are rejected, they get their feelings hurt very easily and they can get mad and wanna kind of be mean to that person. Uh, or maybe they get depressed and suicidal, right? You have to be a good parent. You have to be close with your, 
your kids, right? If you have that closeness, you'll know what's going on and you'll be able to protect them. Um, more about romantic attraction. Let's talk about heterosexual attraction and then we'll talk about the other one, homosexual attraction. Heterosexual attraction usually follows a certain pattern. What happens first is that you're hanging out with your friends and they're of the same sex. Guys are hanging out with guys, girls with girls. And then what happens is that the two groups kind of mingle, right? There's a loose association of the groups and the, uh, the girls group and the boys group, right? They mingle a little, a little bit. They hang out a little bit, but all interactions are very public, right? It's all in public. And then what happens is that some people notice each other within the groups, and then you'll have this smaller uh, mixed same group that will form, uh, you know, form from the larger groups. You'll have a small group of people who kind of get along a little bit and notice a little bit more, and you'll have a smaller group form of boys and girls. And then you'll have a final peeling off of the heterosexual couple. Two people will kind of get together and decide to be together, and then they'll leave the group. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean they won't have friends anymore. They won't be their friends, but they're going to spend more time with each other, you know, and less time with their friends. Homosexual couples are slower to connect. It takes them a little bit longer to find each other because there's less of them, but they follow the same pattern. Homosexual youth, more about homosexual youth. Uh, those that are gay and lesbian are slower to form a romantic attachment. Like I said, there's less of them. So a little bit slower to find each other. And a lot of them uh, at the beginning don't wanna really admit who they are or aren't really too sure whether they are gay or homosexual. Many are reluctant to acknowledge their homosexuality. Only about half of a percent identify as gay or lesbian, like in high school from nine to 12th grade. Think about that. Homosexuality is at least, you know, probably six times higher than that. But a lot of them don't want to admit it, accept it yet, because it's not seen as being cool or being part of the majority or whatever it is. So a lot of them are uh, in the closet, so to speak. Adolescents first become aware of their homosexual interests at around age 11, right around puberty is when they first become aware of this, that they may be different. They might be attracted to the same sex, but they usually don't tell anyone until 17, not until 17 that they actually come out of the closet. Feelings are often denied and concealed through heterosexual involvement. A lot of them will try being with the opposite sex. There are women who are gay and guys who are gay that will try being heterosexual and getting this relationship. Or some of them will even have sex. And, uh, and then they'll realize that that's not who they are, okay? Um, denying feelings can result in depression and suicide, right? There are many who deny, don't wanna accept that they're gay or lesbian or whatever it is. And that's usually really bad when they don't accept themselves, when they think that they're worse or, or unacceptable, and especially they come from a very religious household, a very conservative household, right? They don't feel that they can come out and say that, right? It can make them feel depressed. It can even make them suicidal. And yes, there are plenty of, uh, plenty of adolescents and, and young adults who have committed suicide because they feel that it's unacceptable to be gay or that people do not accept them for who they are. It's a very awful thing to happen, okay? We need to accept and love everybody, okay? Can we just agree on that? 10% of youth report same-sex encounters or desires. About 10% of them will have encounters with the same sex or, or some thoughts, but most of them are not gonna be gay. It's only about 3% or something like that. Um, the statistics vary a little bit. Some research might say as much as 5%. It's a small percentage. Um, communicating about sex. You know what? We'll stop there because we're gonna get into some other things that are also interesting, but uh, we'll save that for later.